Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. And welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an Asian and Pacific Islander point of view. Tonight's show is dedicated to the people of Gangjung Village on Jeju Island in Korea. For eight years now, they have been struggling against the construction of a U.S. Republic of Korea naval base on the island. Now, military bases always cause problems, and this time the naval base is polluting their farmland, dividing families, and raising the threat of war throughout Northeast Asia. You'll be hearing from Kang Dong Jun, mayor of Kang Jung Village, and Jung Young Hee, a tangerine farmer and head of the Women's Association. We'll also be talking with Eugene Kang and Hei Jin Shim from Hobak. That's Hello Organized Bay Area Koreans. I'm Carl Jukbunen Singh, and I'll be your host tonight. Thanks for joining us on Apex Express. As I just said, tonight's show is dedicated to the people's struggle against the construction of a naval base on Jeju Island in South Korea. We'll begin first with a broader look at the global politics that are driving the construction of this naval base. First up, we'll hear from Christine Ahn of the Korean Policy Institute. Christine will speak about the continuing U.S. military expansion in South Korea as part of a larger legacy of the Cold War. The sounds we're hearing is from the Moana Nui conference, which took place last summer. Christine Ahn. One country in the last century and today plays a central role in justifying U.S. military expansion in the Asia Pacific. This country is Korea. Bruce Cummings, the foremost historian of Korea, writes, quote, it was the Korean War, not Greece or Turkey or the Marshall Plan or Vietnam, that inaugurated big defense budgets and the national security state, that transformed a limited containment doctrine into a global crusade, that ignited McCarthyism just as it seemed to fizzle, and thereby gave the Cold War its long run. End quote. Well, just as over 60 years ago, today, North Korea's so-called belligerence legitimates U.S. aggression in the Asia-Pacific. Following North Korea's successful launch of a satellite last December and subsequent testing of its third nuclear weapon, the U.S. led the United Nations Security Council on another round of sanctions, this time enlisting the participation of China. North Korea responded with heightened rhetoric, renouncing the Korean War armistice and threatening, if it were attacked, to strike U.S. and South Korean targets. The key qualifier missed in the U.S. media was if. This event set off a firestorm of militaristic responses, including an unprecedented show of force by the U.S. through its joint war exercises with South Korea. In these war games, the U.S. deployed nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers over South Korea, planes with the capacity to drop 30,000-pound bombs solely developed to destroy North Korea's underground facilities, and the nuclear power submarine USS Cheyenne, equipped with Tomahawk cruise missiles. Last December, former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said the U.S. has been, quote, within an inch of war almost every day, end quote, with North Korea. Well, the truth is, Mr. Panetta, that the U.S. is still at war with North Korea. After four million mostly Korean, mostly civilian lives were taken, the Korean War came to an unresolved end on July 27, 1953, with a temporary armistice signed by the U.S., North Korea, and China. There were three main provisions of this armistice. Number one, within three months, a permanent peace settlement would be negotiated. This never happened. Number two, all foreign troops were to leave, which China 
remove their troops, the U.S. still has 20,500 U.S. troops on about 80 bases and satellites throughout South Korea. Number three, no new weapons would be introduced in Korea, which of course the U.S. violated by introducing and maintaining a nuclear weapon in the South up until the first Bush administration. This history is absolutely crucial to understanding the present. The unended Korean War has everything to do with the current crisis on the Korean Peninsula. It's easy to blame North Korea as the belligerent one, when in fact, the Asia-Pacific pivot and the U.S.-South Korean War games, which involved tens of thousands of U.S. and South Korean troops simulating an invasion and occupation of North Korea, is naturally freaking North Korea out. The reality is that North Korea plays a perfect boogeyman for the U.S. to contain China, without actually even saying so. And it provides a perfect sales pitch for Lockheed Martin, for Boeing, and Northrop Grumman. Since Hillary Clinton announced the Asia-Pacific pivot in 2011, the U.S. weapons manufacturing industry has, despite global economic recession, increased sales by 5%, and forecasts of sales are on the rise with Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Australia, and other U.S. allies in the checkout line. The crisis in Korea is more than a military or geopolitical one. The militarization resulting from the unended war has tremendous costs we never hear about. What's the cost of maintaining division and a permanent state of war? It's not just in the misspending of scarce public dollars in preparation for war, which drains public coffers everywhere. We, of all people, here in the United States, knows what it's like to spend every last dollar on the military-industrial complex, while one in four children in this country goes to bed hungry. The costs of repression on both sides of the DMZ are never also talked about in the name of national security, including in so-called democratic South Korea, where the Cold War national security law labels trade unionists, environmentalists, and other peace and social justice activists as communists and serves to silence and censor most ordinary people from speaking out. I'm speaking of the human rights crisis in North Korea, fueled by 60 years of U.S.-led sanctions which have devastated North Korea's economy and forced its people into destitution. I'm speaking of the crisis facing Korean women whose male partners are conscripted into the military and then later turns the violence he learned in the military towards the women around him. I'm speaking of the sexual violence for truly every single North Korean woman, migrant, young or old, will face in her journey for economic survival. Without a doubt, Korean patriarchy is complicit in all of this, but also sitting behind the wheel is its big brother, the U.S. forces in Korea. In 2006, I saw how the unended war and its various manifestations were directly bearing down on rice farmers who were being displaced from their lands to accommodate the expansion of Camp Humphreys, U.S. military base. After crossing two military checkpoints, passing 200 armed police in riot gear, I arrived late at night and was brought to a barn where dozens of villagers were holding candles in their palms. It was their 811th consecutive candlelight vigil, where they met nightly after a hard day of nonviolent resistance to remind themselves what they were fighting for, their families, their community, their land, their livelihoods, their dignity. I looked around at the room of most, mostly elderly rice farmers, and in my broken Korean, I told them that it is because of my adopted nation's alleged security that is displacing you from the land that you depend on for your survival. Today, instead of lush rice fields and a vibrant community, there stands within the barbed wire fences of Camp Humphreys a Starbucks, a golf course, and water slides. Today, the very same injustice is taking place on Jeju Island off the coast of Korea. 
And that was the voice of Christine Ahn, a policy analyst working to demilitarize the Korean Peninsula. She's speaking at an event, the Mananui, Mananui event, which took place last summer. Up next, we turn to Steph Lee of Hobak. That's Hello Organized Bay Area Koreans. He brings us this quick and dirty guide to the U.S. military in Korea. It's from a Hobak event which took place at the East Side Arts Alliance in 2012 called Constructing Peace, Voices of Resistance from Jeju Island. Just to give you guys all a little bit of context, I'm going to go through a really quick and dirty, I call it the quick and dirty guide to Jeju in Korea and the U.S. military in Korea. So initially we'll see that Guam was sort of the primary staging point that the U.S. wanted to focus on. But they were like, we'll put Jeju on the back burner. Maybe we'll revisit it one day. And it is one day. The U.S. military has been on the peninsula ever since the end of World War II and has never left. So the DMZ is the demilitarized zone. And a Along that, there are 2 million landmines in a 2.5 mile stretch, and then another 1 million landmines along that. 28,000 U.S. military uh, personnel. That was after like a really huge close in the last decade. There have been some base closures. There's still a large presence of the U.S. military. And there was an agreement that was made that by 2012, the U.S. would hand over the military to the Korean government, but then Obama extended it to 2016, and I wonder what will happen in 2016 when that comes to pass. The ROK military is still under the U.S. military control unofficially, and apparently it can officially be completely under U.S. control in wartime. The U.S. still has never signed a peace treaty with North Korea, so technically we're still at war. So when you consider what's wartime, who has the control of the military, right? And then in addition to all of the implications of imperialism, militarism, all of the things that come with military bases, there's also a huge ecological impact. Recently, we found out there was Agent Orange that was utilized during the Korean War. A lot of toxic chemicals have been buried under these bases. And so when these bases were shut down, they've done actual testing of the soils after the bases are gone. They did no cleanup after they shut down the bases. They just kind of left them there, buried a lot of the toxic waste. And so then um, the people who are like left to steward the land are like, what? we have just a toxic waste dump now. The Jeju base is officially being built by the ROK, so the Southern Korean Navy. But initially when this was happening, when people got wind of this base being built, U.S. based activists tried to contact the consulate, tried to contact the South Korean government, and they were actually redirected to the U.S. They were told, actually, why are you calling us? You need to call the U.S. You need to call your own people because this is Obama's new naval base. So this is sort of a way that the U.S. doesn't actually have to necessarily be constructing the base for it to actually house 20 U.S. warships, submarines, and two Aegis destroyers, as well as that wonderful Star Wars military defense system. So that thing from the 80s that Reagan was all excited and jazzed about, it's still around and now it's going to be, it's going to house, be housed at the Jeju Naval Base. And so this is a part of the ongoing Cold War. If you think about the language that's being told, they're like, we need this naval base because it's going to protect us from those crazy North Koreans. They're trying to take over the world. They're going to, you know, bomb us with these missiles and all this stuff's going to happen. But the thing is, is this missile defense system can't actually protect South Korea from the types of weaponry that North Korea has. So when you think about it, it's their low-flying missiles the technology that North Korea has and the missile defense system isn't capable of actually intercepting those low-flying missiles. So then you go, wait a second, what's happening? And this is what's happening. So Jeju is in this really lovely situation geopolitically. Look at all the possible targets from that wonderfully placed island. We've got Russia, they're getting out of control. We got to keep them in line. China, always a big threat, so we got to keep them in line. And of course, if Japan ever touches us off or, you know, we need to go anywhere else in the Pacific, we're going to come off from Jeju. So you see how it's really geopolitically a really important place. Something about Jeju Island, too, that is really important to know is just its own specific history to Korea's history. It's the only site in Korea which had historical struggle against 
Dutch, French, Japanese, and U.S. forces. I would add ROK forces as well. So those are all the, the incursioning groups being like, hey, we want to mess with you. And certainly one really big example of that is the Hazham uprisings. Hazham means 4-3. So April 3rd, a lot of folks rose up to resist the division of Korea. And as a way of quelling the residents and the, the inhabitants of the island, the South Korean government sent youth leagues and they sent ROK police down into the island and basically disappeared, massacred tens of thousands of people. So the conservative estimate is about 30,000. It's between 30 and 80,000 people that were massacred. And it's about more than 10% of the population, mostly uh, young men and boys. It was part of the government strategy to quell the communist stronghold. A lot of the folks who were fighting were actually pushed down into the island. Some people actually had to leave. And so even Koreans and diaspora in Japan, a lot of them fled from Jeju-do to Japan as well. And so some other statistics, 70% of the villages burned to the ground, 82 whole villages never recovered and don't exist today. And a little bit about Jeju culture, which I feel like a lot of people reference, and you'll see this in sort of social media a lot, is that it's a matriarchal society. It's the only matriarchal society in Korea, which is kind of a big deal if you no Koreans or Korean culture. <laughs> and it's a communal farming culture. And because so many men were killed in the 4-3 massacre as well, as a result of that and forced into the labor camps or drafted into the war, women were left in charge of families and farms. But of course, even prior to that event, it was still very strongly matriarchal. And of course, these images are of the Henyo divers, which you may have seen on the internet. Really strong, tight culture and have a strong position in villages as like the money maker the breadwinner, the people who are able to harvest from the sea. And then an interesting fact that I didn't know is during Japanese colonial rule, 17,000 henyo took to the streets with knives to resist forced labor. And that was Steph Lee of Hobak. Next up, we'll be hearing from Kang Dong Jun and Jung Young Hee. Kang Dong Jun is the mayor of Kang Jung Village on Jeju Island. He's speaking at the Mononui Conference, which took place last year. We'll also hear from Jung Young Hee, who's a tangerine farmer and chairwoman of the Woman Villagers Committee to stop the Jeju Naval Base. This is from a talk at the Eastside Cultural Center, which took place two years ago. Thank you, everyone. My name is Gang Dong Jun, and I represent Kang Jung Village, located in Jeju Island, which is a part of the Republic of Korea. I'm very excited and grateful to stand and speak in front of you all. Hello, my name is Jung Young Hee. I came here from Gangjong Village on Jeju Island. It's been 23 years since I came to Gangjong and got married. Kangjang Village is located on the southern side of Jeju Island and was founded about 450 years ago. The village is famous for its fresh, clean spring water and its natural environment. I love the Gangjong Sea. When you go to the sea, you can catch ogal and pomal as well as octopus. And if you're skillful, sea ear too. In 1948 and 1950, the Republic of Korea had faced great and tragic events. On June 25, 1950, Koreans faced tragedy as the Korean War began. It seems like it was the separation between the North and South that created the war. However, at that time, Korea was just a victim of the power struggle between the world's powers. And still, the pain remains. Furthermore, in 1948, an event took place 
which the state's attorney calls the April 3rd Jeju people massacre. And while this massacre was taking place, the American government, even while saying with their words that they believed in peace, were behind the scenes pulling strings. There were more than 30,000 people killed out of a population of 280,000. The pain still remains. Looking at Korea, especially Jeju Island, from a geographical viewpoint, we can see that it is located in the center of the Pacific and in the center of the world's powers. And therefore, it is an important strategic location. But in Jeju Island today, a naval base is being built. And behind the base, there is the U.S. government. Whether or not Jeju Island remains an island of peace or turns into an island that's a military base. Whether or not the powers around the world carefully observe the situation is a crucial problem. The naval base activity happening on Jeju Island is not only putting Korea in risk and danger, but it is also destroying the Kangjung village community and kicking the people of Jeju Island out of their homes. My village has been fighting for seven years now against the naval base construction. I could not believe it when I first heard the news that the base would be built. Most women have no idea about national defense matters, but I knew that there should be no naval base in our village. When there was an official villagers' vote on August 20, 2007, 680, or 94 percent, out of 725 villagers opposed the naval base project. Over 70 percent of our village voted, and many villagers cheered at the results. The government did not acknowledge the official vote. Instead, on April 26, 2007, they held an unofficial vote with only 87 people, mostly Hanya sea diving women and pro-base villagers. They approved the project by a clap of hands, and they reported to the media that this represented the collective opinion of the entire village. Most villagers were not informed about this meeting. The Navy secretly gathered some influential people and uneducated Henya who were easily deceived. June 19th, the day of the official vote on the naval base project, the Navy bribed the Henya sea diving women and pro-base villagers to steal the ballot box that contained the will of the village majority. At that time, we were preparing to count the votes at the village community hall. Around 7 p.m., a group of Hanya sea diving women suddenly charged in and ran away with the ballot box. I learned later that there were two police wagons standing by at the village tomb for the war dead, next to the bridge above Kangjung Stream. They were planning to incite violence and arrest all of us to end the whole thing quickly. When I saw photos on the internet of the incident, I saw that there were police, even personnel from the Navy and island government at the site. When a small town holds a meeting, isn't it a nasty way for government institutions to respond? I want to speak about the pro-base villagers for a moment. 
해녀 전부가 찬성하고 있는 것은 아닙니다. Many Hanya sea diving women favored the naval base project, but not all of them favor it now. 전 마을 해장을 매수했습니다. 해군은 The Navy tricked the Hanya and the former mayor. They were told that each person would be given 150 million won. That's around $136,000. Now they've received 70 million won, $63,000, and that's the highest amount. 60 million won and 50 million won. The Hanya were deceived by the Navy, but they won't speak up because they're afraid that the Navy will demand that they return the money, which they may have already spent. And we've been listening to the voices of Zhang Yonghee and Kang Dong Jun. Before we continue, let's take a short musical break. And thanks for joining us on Apex Express. You're tuned to KPFA 94.1. We've been listening to the voices of Kang Dong Jun, mayor of Gangjung Village on Jeju Island, and Jung Young Hee, chairwoman of the Women Villagers Committee to stop the Jeju Naval Base, as they speak up in resistance to the construction of a naval base on Jeju Island. Now back to their talks. <laughs> 제주도 강정 마을에 해군 기지를 건설하면서 the navy is stating that by building the naval base there will be improvement in national security that there will be improvement in the economy and it will help the military coexist peacefully with the people but i believe this is nonsense the construction of this naval base will only make the world powers nervous and cause risk to national security think about this how will this help to improve the economy the people were never notified about the Jeju naval base construction and the government just went straight through the process of construction. The people of Kangjung Village did not have a chance to voice their opinions because they had no idea about the base being constructed. We villagers didn't know much about land expropriation laws. In 2009, Kim Tae-hwan, the former Jeju Island governor and island council members from the Grand National Party, passed a bill to end the designation of Kurambi as an absolute preservation area to allow for the construction of the naval base at this location. The Navy used an expedited process to negotiate the purchase of 51% of the land and then stole the remaining land through expropriation. Originally, they were only able to purchase 49% of the land, much of which had been owned by outsiders. But the Navy got the additional 2% by purchasing a public road. Then the Navy gave each landowner whose land was expropriated a deposit. They viciously threatened the landowners who were not willing to give up their land, saying to them, Uncle, if you don't accept the deposit within two years, you'll be fined 15%. In fact, that was a lie. By taking away the land of the people opposing the naval base construction without proper communication and just continuing their process, the government is behaving irrationally and causing confusion and bad feelings in the people of Jeju Island. Because of the problems of the naval base, friends and families are facing conflicts, becoming enemies, and destroying the peaceful community of Jeju Island. 
지금 해군 기지 공사당 정문 오른쪽에 저희 시아버지 Currently to the right of the naval base site there's a shrine to honor 12 ancestors who were born in the same year as k y o n j a 매년 어버이날인 5월 Every year on May 8th Parents Day in Korea their descendants hold a joint service to honor their ancestors 당했지만 지금까지 우리는 싸우고 있습니다 Even though the shrine has already been expropriated, we are still fighting to save it. We received notice that it will be forcefully removed at the end of this month. During this whole process, we villagers felt so despondent and sad. Are we island people so powerless? How can there be such oppression by the island governor and council members who we elected ourselves? Despite all this, the Gangjong villagers, especially women, led the struggle with a single heart that we should unconditionally save our village. It is women who have been at the front when they hear the Navy will visit the Village Association Hall. It was the same when we went to protest the island government. The police beat us, trampled us, and covered our bodies with bruises. Still, we could not stop. In the hot summer and the cold winter, we performed 1,000 bows at the town square. I even shaved my head twice in protest. All of this is caused by the Korean government and military. And behind the Korean government stands the American government. As I said before, in order for the true security of the nation to take place, the people and the government and military should make a consensus. However, the irrational behavior that the government and military is showing right now with the construction of the naval base is causing a loss of trust. Now, many of us villagers are not well. Many of us are taking medications and treatments for the symptoms of hypochondria or fear. There are ringing sirens, loud noises from construction vehicles, dump trucks, cement mixer trucks, violence by the police and thugs hired by the construction companies, and pressure from the government and Navy. Because of our struggle, k a n g j o n g villagers and activists have become labeled criminals. Do you know that hundreds of villagers have become criminals just for opposing the naval base construction project? We are citizens of the country, but they say we are pro-North Korea, left-wing, just for opposing the project. The more painful thing is that our collective spirit has disappeared and even brothers are divided. Before this naval base issue came up, we were innocent rural villagers. The naval base issue has torn the village apart piece by piece. Before the issue of the naval base came up, our village was alive with the Jeju tradition of s u n o r u m We performed all the religious services together, shared happy and sad events, and farmed with our neighbors. However, the government and navy incited some villagers, making them pro-base. They intentionally divided the village. With the community spirit broken, we had difficulty in our jobs. Moreover, the respect for elders has disappeared, and young people speak disrespectfully to elders. It is heartbreaking.
그런가 하면 많은 주민들의 생업이도 했던 강귤 농사는 해군기지 Many of the villagers are tangerine farmers and were suffering directly from the naval base construction. I am a tangerine farmer myself. Imagine how I felt when I saw my tangerines, my precious children that I have nurtured, rotting away from the pollution flying from the construction site. 강정은 제주에서 일강정이라고 불릴 만큼 농사 짓기 좋아. Gangjong has been called Ilgangjong, which means the best village for agriculture in Jeju, and we have brought the best products of any agricultural field. Now our occupation is being threatened. The government is directly intervening with the Jeju naval base construction in illegal manipulation of the law by arresting more than 700 people in Jeju, bringing 400-plus cases of judicial action and with 25 cases of imprisonment. All these crises will not fix any problems, but rather they make the situation worse, creating mistrust and problems with people. The government is trying to appease us, offering a small amount of financial compensation. But our conditions, like those endangered species as the red feet crabs, Jeju freshwater shrimps, and narrowmouth toads that have been robbed of their hometowns and forcefully relocated or killed, cannot be compensated with any amount of money. Above all, we villagers feel that our childhood memories are being destroyed. Do you know that many villagers have attempted suicide from disappointment and despair at the destruction and loss of their hometown? However, we could not afford to sit back. Through the Women's Village Association, we provided food and rice wine to console villagers who were deep in despair. The members of the folk conservation cheered them by playing traditional Korean instruments. The members of Jeju's cultural groups would come and cheer us on, dance, sing songs, and end the day together with us. Then we would stand up again, crying for peace, and shout, Let's save our village. We can do it. The people of Kangjung have to follow what the government authorities do. If they hit us, we have to be hit. If they press us down and try to trample us, we can't do much. We have no choice but to be dragged around like a dog. Even if we do get dragged down and hurt and torn into pieces, I know if we fight for what we truly believe in and fight for Kangjung Village, we will influence the future and serve as a foundation for a better future. So the good foundation we build in seven years of work will continue on through the next 70 years. And it will continue on beyond that. But we will not struggle for only 70 years. We will struggle until we die. 우리 강정 마을의 반대 주민들은 처음 2007년 절대적으로 평화지로 해야 싸움이 명분이 있다고 했습니다. In 2007, when our struggle began, we anti-base villagers in Kangjong thought that only absolute pacifism could justify our fight. We restrained violent acts and decided not to slander pro-base villagers. We thought that people would only help us if we fought peacefully. However, the reality pushes good-natured villagers into criminals. Reflecting now, we were like fools because we had known so little about the world. However, Gangjong villagers, including myself, are becoming much more aware, and the world is starting to know about Gangjong. 
많이 지쳤고 피눈물을 흘렸습니다. In the past seven years of struggle, many of us in Jeju have shed a lot of tears. We are exhausted. There were times when despair came before hope, but we never gave up because of a sense of duty and the belief that our work will help future generations. I did not imagine that this peaceful struggle would be so difficult and such a long-term fight. But one thing is clear. We hope the naval base project will be revoked and that Northeast Asia will become a peace zone. We will fight until we restore peace in our village. Another way to look at despair is that at the end of despair, we find the start of new hope and desire. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to all the international activists who have visited Gangjong and expressed solidarity despite oppression and threats by the police, arrest, entry denial, and forceful exit. I deeply thank all the people who came here today. I ask you to one day visit my village in the future. I ask you to continue solidarity for the peace of Northeast Asia and to join us in our struggle. Thank you for listening. And once again, you're listening to Apex Express, and the voices we've been listening to were the voices of Kang Dong Jun, mayor of Gangjung Village on Jeju Island, and Jung Young Hee, a tangerine farmer and chairwoman of the Woman Villagers Committee to stop the Jeju Naval Base Project. Up next, we are fortunate to be able to have in studio with us today Eugene Kang and Hei Jin Shim, members of Hello Organized Bay Area Koreans, or Hobak. And they've been working to support the resistance to the naval base on Jeju Island. Well, thank you for joining us here in the station, Eugene and Hajin. Yeah, thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having us. How did you first hear about the struggle going on in Jeju Island? Um, well, I first heard about the struggle in Jeju um, through Hobak, actually. Um, Hobak had done a series of fundraisers and solidarity events. And that's how I first learned about it. And that's how I got more involved. Yeah, I also first heard about the naval base struggle through Hobak as well. And so how long have you all been involved in Hobak? I've been in Hobak for about almost three years now, I think. Two years. Two, and what, what is it that Hobak does? Hello, what is it? Hello Organized Bay Area Koreans. It's a cool name. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So, so what do you do as part of Hobak? Um, Hobak is an anti-imperialist, anti-militarism group um, that consists of... Koreans in diaspora living in the Bay Area. Okay. Right on. And so I know, so you're saying you heard about Jeju through your work with Hobak. And then I, I also heard that you um, both had the chance to, to visit the island. Right. Mm-hmm. So what so inspired you about what you learned? What did you learn that, that um, made you feel that it was necessary to go and, and make a trip all the way to the other side of the world? Well, I think through... Um, different events that Hobak had organized and through connections that we built um, in solidarity. Um, I just felt really compelled to go support the struggle um, in person and um, share stories with people who live there, with the activists and villagers, um, see the actual devastation of the um, construction of the naval base, and um, just support these tremendously, like, fierce organizers who were really brave and have been like fighting for seven years and are like basically going to be fighting until the end like as long as it takes um so yeah what, what are those some of those conditions that you're talking about the condition the devastating conditions that were going on oh some of the devastation was um is well Kangjung is a 
it's a fishing and farming town and it's created a lot of pollution and a lot of um, farmers have been displaced from the areas that they work in. Um, there's been a lot of pollution due to the construction as well, which directly affects the fisher people and the hanyo who are um, harvesting directly from the sea. Um, and the wa- and that area, that shoreline, it's really precious. It's a unique um, uh, ecological habitat. Mm-hmm. And it's actually as... It's um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Oh, right, right, right. I yeah, remember hearing and that. And so there's been a lot of ecological damage, not to mention like emotional damage to to the people who live there. Right. Of all the places they could choose to put a military base in some ways, they have to pick this most precious of sites. Right. right. Yeah. And, and so, Heijin, uh, maybe you can jump in here too. What, what, what was it that so moved you to want to go see for yourself. Right. I had been to Gangjong Village once in 2012 on as part of a political solidarity trip and I went back again this past summer as an interpreter for a friend who was doing a media project about the naval base struggle as well. So I really jumped on the chance to go back with her because I think an international solidarity um person to person relationships is really important if you don't have that connection if we're not if we're not friends if we're not building together then how can we trust each other from so far away and still feel passionate about supporting one another so um it was really for me about learning more and also being able to communicate directly in real time face to face with mm-hmm. people who are fighting yeah, a hundred percent on that one. Uh, you know, the face to face makes such a big difference, and it, the struggle becomes real. Then it's like yeah, it's yeah. one thing to hear, "Oh yeah, devastation," or to really mm-hmm. understand what that is, and to to see and build with folks who are struggling against that. So maybe you can, since the rest of us didn't have a chance to go over there, maybe you can uh, give us an example of some of the um, experiences you had that that stood out for you. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the really. Um Intense experiences that I had was um, after we had, when we arrived in Kangjang, we um, were just in time for the peace march, that the annual peace march. And um, just after that, um, when things sort of settled down into the normal everyday dealings of struggling against this giant, you know, naval base that's happening um, and getting to witness that and um, learn from the people who are, who are living it every day and... Um, trying to figure out the best way to support them there and to support them when I was to come back home. Um, but just the way that the people there really took care of each other and really took care of me and really mm-hmm. went out of their way to share about the place that they live and to make sure that I was you know, taken care of and that I was safe um, really stood out to me, like the, all the care that they show while they're amidst this incredibly difficult and traumatic struggle was really... It was really amazing to experience. And Heijin? For me, I think it was the opportunity to really hear people's stories in their own words. You know, there are stories that you'll hear through interviews and such, but there's also stories that you'll only get when you're um, having dinner together or having drinks after a long day together, after a long day of work or a long day of interviews and such. And, um, and I thought people's reflections about the struggle and about their role in the struggle, um, their reflections were really profound and and I think encapsulated a lot of why I'm passionate about these things too. Um, I remember talking with one woman who um, actually runs a women's shelter very close to Gangjong, and she was saying, you know, historic, like, indigenous to Jeju is this idea of three absences. So in Jeju Island, we value the three absences of no walls, no, no walls, no poverty, no poverty, and um, oh shoot, <laughs> <laughs> no walls, no, stealing. no poverty, and yeah, no walls, no poverty, and no stealing. Fantastic, and um, and so. She was talking about how when the naval base comes in, it brings all of those things. It brings the theft of the land, which the villages mm-hmm. are experiencing. Mm-hmm. It raises these huge walls so that people can't access their land anymore. And it also impoverishes people because you're taking away their um, their connection to the land and to the water where they've been harvesting their livelihoods for generations and generations. And she made that connection so simple and so easy to understand and was talking about how the military and capitalism have really been impacting people in Jeju who have been living this way for, as I said before, for generations. And that's all changing really rapidly. 
Yeah, it, it really strikes me as you're talking. It seems to be like th- that's one of the things that we're lacking here is that, and that's why it stands out so much is the community that folks have. Eugene, you were talking earlier about how the, the feeling of being taken care of, of how people really care for. And once you start splitting that down, mm-hmm. you know, once you start building these walls, like you're saying, hey, Jen, then that causes all the problems. So, you know, we we are faced with like these huge like kind of these huge overwhelming battles all across the world you know what can we do here folks that are in the bay area to to learn and support about what's going on over there well um that's a really big question and a really good question um eugene and i were actually talking about how to answer this question because it is a hard one and this is kind of a really huge struggle amongst many other struggles all across the world in the united states and we um and i was thinking that it starts with something as simple as building connections with each other and the people that you're trying to be in solidarity with so that begins with things like learning more and educating yourself a little bit more um learning about organizations local to you that might be doing the kind of work that you're interested in um building relationships with people there by sending letters or sending photos of actions that you're doing um and you know there's also stuff like writing to elected representatives in your area and um but we were thinking that, you know, it's really important to start with building connections to each other and to other struggles and making that, those connections more apparent. Um, mm-hmm. And we were also thinking, too, like in terms of concrete stuff, um, sending financial support to the villagers in Kangjong is really crucial right now because mm-hmm. they've mm-hmm. all been being like hit with tons and tons of fines, like thousands of dollars. And what are the fines for? What is that about? Um, you th- they, they hit the activists with trumped up charges like mm-hmm. assaulting police officers when they're trying to block, um, when they're trying to stay in front of the naval base construction gate so that the vehicles can't pass through. They're charged with obstructing construction, um, things like that. And so, so what's going to happen now on Kangjung Village? What's, what's going to happen? Is this military base going to go on? Can we protect this can we preserve this is it possible yeah i mean it's unclear i mean i think continually continuing to support the struggle and to um put pressure maybe on legislation and on our local um legislation and abroad i think would really be helpful and also sending um, support to the villagers as well. Okay, so folks who don't know necessarily how to go about getting more information themselves or how to link up with folks who maybe can get funds to them, how how would folks go about um, getting some more information? Um, people can um, look up um, their website, savejejunow.org, and they can learn more in depth uh, in villagers' words about the struggle and get information on how to support as well and, and give contacts on who to contact. T- tell us again that, that website. SaveJejuNow.org. Sa- Save Jeju Now and Jeju is J-E-J-U. Yeah. And did you have something to add right there, hey, Jen? Um No, I think that's good. Okay, so we're, we're quickly coming to the end of tonight's show. So any last thoughts, anything that you would like to share with our listeners out there, the Apex family, KPFA family out there? I think like Eugene said, um, when you asked about, you know, can this military base really be fought off? Mm -hmm. um, And Eugene answered that it's unsure. I think um, it's really important that we fight as hard as we can when the most when it's unsure, because um, that's when the people need the most morale and need the most support. So thank you all for listening. Yeah, support the struggle. Right on. And tell us the website one more time. SaveJejuNow.org. Excuse me. <laughs> Save Jeju now, and we and don't you guys have a report back coming up soon? Isn't there? Isn't yeah, there? thank you. We're actually going to be me and Hedgen are going to be giving our report back on this trip that um, we're speaking of. It's going to be this Sunday from four to six at Eastside Arts Alliance. Okay, this Sunday from four to six at Eastside Arts Alliance. A report back uh, from both of you. Will other folks be there as well, or is it's uh, you two there? Uh, it'll be just us two reporting back on our trip. <laughs> right on. Yeah. So you, you heard it here first, the East Side Arts Alliance. And if folks want to get more information about that, where can they turn to? I guess eastsideartsalliance.org. Yeah, or you know. they can email us at hobak, H-O-B-A-K, 510 at com. Okay, that's hobak, H-O-B-A-K, 510 at gmail.com. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eugene Kong and Heijin Shem, for joining us here in studio, taking the time out to share this important, pressing story with us. Thank, thank you. you. Carl. 
And that's quickly brought us to the end of tonight's show. So before we go off the air, we'd like to bring you the community calendar. This Saturday, March 8th, join poet and playwright Amy Suzara in celebrating the launch of her new poetry book, Souvenir. The party begins at 7.30 p.m. at Soul Space. That's 1713 Telegraph Avenue in Oakland and features poetry readings, question and answers, and a book signing. Don't forget to get your tickets for CanFest 2014. The Center for Asian American Media's festival features films, music, and food. It opens next Thursday, March 13th, with events in San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley. This year's festival features one of our sheroes, Grace Lee Boggs. The movie American Revolutionary, The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs, is playing on Sunday, March 16th at 6.30 p.m. at the Castro Theater in San Francisco. For tickets and more information about CanFest, visit canfest.com. That's C A A M Fest.com. Don't forget this Sunday at the Eastside Arts Alliance at four from four to six PM will be a report back from Hobok on their trip to Jeju Island. And let's see what else we got for you right here. Don't forget also on Tuesday, March eleventh, will be the three year anniversary of the meltdown at the Fukushima Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. For three years, TEPCO had been bungling the remediation effort while the life and health of everyone on this planet has been seriously threatened by the uncontained release of radiation, especially here in Japan. Join the worldwide protests against the Fukushima disaster in front of Japanese consulates around the world. In San Francisco, you can go to 50 Fremont Street near the Embarcadero BART station at 3 p.m. You can also check out nonukesaction.word press.com and for more details on this community calendar to find archive shows visit our website apexexpress.org our outro music tonight was produced by Asian Crisis and that quickly brings us to the end of tonight's show Apex Express 7pm find us next week right here on KPFA 94.1 thanks to Celia Julane for her backup support thanks to Eugene and Hajin for joining us here tonight thanks to the good folks at Hobok the people of Kangjung Village and all my Asian and Pacific Islander family around the globe who are standing up for a better, kinder, more peaceful world. With Wesley Burton holding down the controls, I've been your host, Kajik Bundesing. Super, super, super special thanks to Marie Che for producing tonight's show. Thanks for joining us tonight on Apex Express. Stay tuned for The Bonnie Simmons Show.